want you to go to the, the book of 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number, um, I want you to turn to chapter number 7. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you where I'm going to end up at, and, but then we're going to go back to chapter 1 and see how we got here. It says in 1 Samuel chapter number 7 and verse number uh, 15, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, that is the house of God, to Gilgal and Mizpah, place of witness, and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there... He built an altar unto the Lord. The message tonight uh, will explain itself as, as I go along, but I'm going to preach to you tonight about the grace of a child. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray now for your spirit to come, and Lord, give clarity of mind and of thought. And Father, we, uh, our, our hearts are heavy tonight. We have uh, so many from our midst that, Lord, are, uh, again, uh, just hurting in an affliction, in a physical trial. And, uh, Lord, many are just, uh, we have so many that have been so sick recently, and, and some are even here tonight not feeling well. But Father, this is your time, and your people, and your place, and we thank you above all that we have your word and your spirit. And so, Father, we pray that tonight that your spirit would guide us, Lord, carefully and clearly through the word of God, that we would minister grace to the hearers and be help to our homes and to our families, Lord, in days and years to come as in days of years past. Lord, we'll give, be careful to give you our thanks and our praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'll just, by way of introduction, I'm going to go to some verses in chapter 1, but I'm going to take you through chapter 1 tonight. But I just want to kind of set the background of the scene that is here. We know in chapter 1 is where the story of where Hannah, the mother of Samuel, was barren, could not have a child, and prayed, and God gave her a son, answered her prayer, but... Even more, God did more for her than just give her a son uh, in giving her the prophet Samuel. Now, the book of Judges, of course, the book of Ruth precedes the book of 1 Samuel, and that is a part of the period of Judges. And even here in chapter 1, you are still at the very end of the period of Israel's history that is just known simply as the book of Judges. Now, this is one of the darkest periods in Israel's history, and it, if you look at the history of Israel, there were very few bright lights in Israel's history, honestly. Most of Israel's history is dark. Now, we judge darkness in different ways, and it's important to understand, uh, you know, our, we would look at it and just measure it by the wickedness of Israel. In fact, the theme of the book of Judges, a verse that's repeated on more than one occasion, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Well, when every man's doing just whatever he thinks is right, everything's going wrong. And there was certainly great wickedness in that time, but that is not how darkness is measured according to the nation of Israel. Darkness Israel measured light and darkness by the revelation of the light of God's word. Israel measured light and darkness by the fact that they had a prophet, because they didn't have a written word of God as we have, but they had a prophet that was revealing the word and the will of God. And at this time, look, that is how Israel was founded. God started with one man uh, by the name of Abram, and who became Abraham, and God revealed himself um, seven, eight times over the life of Abraham from, uh, that God appeared to him, revealed his word, his will, and his way. And that is how that opened, that light was what led Abraham uh, 1,100 miles from the Ur of the Chaldees, 700 miles into the, uh, uh, into the land of Haran, and then another 400 miles into the land of Promise. It, it was revealed by that light. And at this time, the book of Samuel tells us in chapter 3, verse 1, that the word of the Lord was precious in, the, in those days. There was no open vision. They had no light. They had no light of the revealed word of God. Uh, let me just remind you, church, we have been giving something very great. 
something this world is honestly, you and I do not, I, I think that we failed to recognize because we have, we have had it all of our lives that this world has not had it that long as we have it. I mean, for, for what it took to get the Bible and the plowboy, the hands of every plowboy in England took 1,600 years from the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the completion of the canon of scriptures and then to, to have it passed on as we have it today delivered to us. There was no light and there had been no light. All they could do is follow the last order given and it had been decades. And in fact, if you look at the period of Judges, there was very little open revelation, very little light, very few prophets. There were judges, but not that many prophets. And most of the prophets that did speak, they didn't have a positive message to bring because everybody was doing that which was right in their own eyes. Because the light of the body is the eye. And Jesus said, if thine eye be full of darkness, how great is that darkness? But if thine eye be full of light, how great is that light? If the eye is single, Jesus said. You can have darkness, darkness or you can have light. And there just wasn't much light. So there had been judges and, and some miracles and some brief times of relief from bondage but very little word from the prophets. And in, in Samuel, when Samuel came, there was no open vision. And it was at this time that we come to learn about a man and his family from the tribe of Ephraim. It would be good to know something about Ephraim to grasp the full scope of what is about to happen with the birth of Samuel. Now, remember, when we, we're in Genesis chapter 49, and we'll see more of this next week in the, the second part of that message on the judgment seat of Jacob that Joseph, his name is not, you don't find Joseph's name on the map of the 12 tribes of Israel. The double portion that was belonged to Reuben that he had forfeited by his carnal and fleshly appetites went to Joseph. And so since Joseph was given a double portion, he had two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And so the, names, uh, the name of Joseph is born throughout the nation of Israel by the names of his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Ironically, and we call them Ephraim and Manasseh, but Ephraim is the younger and Manasseh is the elder. We would think you, we, we would call them Manasseh and then Ephraim. Manasseh, when he, uh, when he was born, his name means forgetting. When Manasseh was born, Joseph made this statement. He said, for God said he hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. God had brought him into a place in the palace of Pharaoh where he had forgotten the fact that his brothers had hated him, had sold him into slavery. He forgot how he went, rose up in Potiphar's, started out as a menial slave in Potiphar's house to governor of Potiphar's house, slandered and lied by Potiphar's wife back into prison, 13 years in prison, forgotten by, um, the, uh, forgotten by the, uh, the king's cupbearer and, or, or by, the, by, by the baker or by the king's cupbearer and then, Finally being brought out, God had forgot, caused him to forget. And then he had, gave birth to Ephraim, whose name means fruitful. You have a forgetting son and a fruitful son. And the old message is, if you, uh, you have to give birth to a forgetting if you're ever going to be fruitful because bitterness withholds the blessing. Now, Manasseh was born before Ephraim, but we always say Ephraim and Manasseh because when Jacob came to bless the sons of Joseph, Joseph, remember, put them before his father because Jacob's eye was dim and he put the right hand upon the elder son Manasseh and the, uh, and the left hand upon the head of Ephraim. But, uh, but jo Jacob switched his hands and switched sons. And the Bible says that Joseph guided his hands wittingly as he thought that, and, and he said, said to his father, not so. He, he said, the, the blessing goes to the eldest. And, and Jacob said, I know it, I know it. He'll be great too. But the blessing goes to the younger, just as Jacob was the younger son and blessed above Esau. Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And so that is a land. They, this is a family that was dwelling in the double portion of the blessing of the nation of Israel. And not just, and this wasn't in Manasseh, this was in Ephraim, not just a double portion, but the fruitful portion of Joseph's blessing. Now, I want, now, now, bearing that in mind, I want you to 
look at verse number one. I'm going to read down to verse number six. And I want you to pay attention to the childless situation here. Now, there was a certain man of Ramathim Zophim. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. You don't know if I'm pronouncing that wrong, okay? Of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jerome, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, an Ephrathite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. This is before the, the temple was built in Jerusalem. This is before the days of even King Saul. And so the tab tabernacle was in the house of Shiloh, the house of peace. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Penina his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah... He gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. So this brings us to this family, Elkanah and his two wives, Hannah and Penina. There's some division about the meaning of the name of Elkanah. It's one of those that's a little more ob obscure, but it's generally believed that it means that God hath obtained or God hath purchased. Um, it is, and, and he took a wife by the name of Hannah. Hannah was his first wife, and the name of the other wife was Penina. And the name Hannah means grace or gracious or beauty. It's the beauty of grace. That's where the grace of a child comes from for the title. And he had a gracious wife. He had a, a, a beautiful wife, but she was a childless wife. And in those days, the barren womb was just all but unbearable. I, I mean, there, there was no greater wealth. There wasn't enough money in the stock market to take the place of just having a child, especially a son. And Elkanah, it appears, did a great disservice to a gracious and a beautiful wife by taking a second wife by the name of Penina. Why would he do that? Well, dwelling in the land of fruitfulness was a childless woman, a woman that was fruitless. And he did that because he understood, it, it, and it's something that we have lost sight of. I understand, we live in a generation without natural affection, and I understand in our church that we have good moms and dads that love children and love their children. I know this, which is why there will always be dissension in the nursery. Because you care. I know this because it's hard, especially with your first baby, to put your child in the nursery because nobody can care for your baby like you care for your baby. And that's right. But there are people here that care for your children. And by the time you have baby two and three, you are glad to take your children to the nursery for a little relief, all right? You'll take whatever servers you can get. The words have not yet been written, but... The, the words of a fruitful home are, are carried all throughout the Bible. The 127th Psalm, except the Lord build the house. This is not speaking about just the house of God. It is speaking about the home, the Christian home. Again, there's a difference between a home and a Christian home. It's a dual prophecy. It's a dual implication here. Except, And you see it as it goes along. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord uh, keep the city, keep his watch. The, the watchman wake it but in vain. Look, every city's been conquered at some point. But when God's keeping watch, nobody can touch it unless he allows it. He said, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. He said, it's a, it's a meaningless to get up early worrying about this, to stay up late and lose sleep worrying about it, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Do you know what puts a parent to, to rest at night? The Lord is watching over your children. By the way, the Bible tells us that his angels do always befold the face of the children. Do, do, do children have garden angels? Yes, they do. I Absolutely. Why? why? Because God said so. That's why. Now, when you grow up and you get mean and ornery, I think he backs off a little bit. But he says that there are angels. Always behold the, 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 the face of the children. And he says, and, and when he says, Lo, he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, pay attention to this. Children are an heritage 
of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. He, they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. The fruit of the womb is his reward. But that had been withheld from Hannah. And you know, I don't know why. There are people that have no desire to have children, and they have children. There are people that would love to have children, and, and God, I, I believe we'd look at him and, and know that they would be wonderful children. By the way, I know this because I've watched those people through the years. And you know what? The wise ones are wise enough to find there's always a child that needs someone to love them and care for them. And I have watched families like that that have not had children of their own, but I have watched them very quietly and very sweetly become parents to all kinds of children in the church. You know, as a pastor, we only have one. Our quiver wasn't that big, and we're thankful for the, the, the one we have. I'm still trying to figure out if I'm thankful for Paul or not. I think so, but I'm just not sure. It's going to depend on what he gets me for my birthday this year. I can pretty much tell you that. And, uh, of course, we have one in heaven. But, you know, as a pastor, um, I pray for parents like nobody else in this church. Say, why? Because I am, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm the godparent to the entire church family. So I pray God keeps you alive. We consider it an honor and a privilege. Anytime parents say, hey, if something happens, can you t will you take care of the kids? I mean, we really are. We have, we have never said no to anybody. I've never looked twice at the kids. I've looked twice at some of the parents thinking, there ain't no way to take you, the parent, but always for the kids. And I'm just saying, I understand that I'm in a, in a room full of people that realize this is the the Lord's reward, but we live in a society that doesn't regard that anymore. And I'm just trying to help you understand that Hannah was that, that one fruitless woman in that fruitful land. And Elkanah took a second wife, not as beautiful as Hannah. Her name means coral. She wasn't, she wasn't as beautiful and as gracious as Hannah. If you had coral, it's, it's not a precious gemstone. It might be unique. In fact, sometimes it's very sharp, and there was a very sharp the Bible says in verse 6 that this was her adversary, that she provoked her sore. You know why? Because it was a Leah and a Rachel situation. Elkanah loved Hannah. He was the, she was the first love. There was, no diff, there was no contention. But Penina could give the children. And because Penina had the children, but she didn't have the love, she was more or less a bit of a concubine. She was being used for a service in those days, which was not right, but often happened. And she had multiple children because it says that he gave portions to all of Penina's sons, plural, and daughters. That means she had at least four. And it brought great sorrow and contention to, to the two just as it did in Jacob's home between Leah and Rachel. And in both cases, the wife that was beautiful and beloved was barren. And they were not barren because of their beauty, as some might have you believe. Hannah was a very godly woman. This chapter and what bears on in the nation of Israel, this is the because of, look, I'm here to tell you, if it were not for this woman, Hannah, I wonder if Israel would not have remained in darkness. Was it not for the righteous desire of Hannah to have a child? This was not punishment. There was a purpose. And again, the, you know, the thing with God's purposes, we know that he has a purpose. We know that all things work together for good. But we don't always know that until, until God reveals it somewhere later in our lives and sometimes not until we get to heaven. But it was for a purpose. And it's good for you. By the way, parents, let me remind you something. You have something. There are people in this world that would love to have what you have. They desire that heritage, that inheritance that is God's reward. That is a reward. Each and every child you have been given is God's reward. And with great, reward, with great privileges come great responsibilities. That comes with a responsibility. We don't deserve those children. They're a sacred trust. And Hannah here in verse 7, we see that this was just how, how great her travail by her cry. This childless woman 
and now the cry of this woman. Verse number seven, as he did so year by year going up to the sacrifice, when, when she, Hannah, went up to the house of the Lord, so, or, or, so she provoked her, therefore she wept and did not eat. Every year they go to the house of the Lord. All of Penina and her children and Hannah with no children and, and Penina would at that time provoke her and Hannah would cry and not eat. And I'm going to tell you, if there's something a man can't take, it's when the wife cries. And if the wife cries and isn't eaten, you're in a bad way. Verse 8, Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? That man loved her with all his heart. There's no greater love than the love of a husband and a wife. That is the preeminent love in the home. But there's another kind of love that God has made for men and women as parents. Obviously, Elkanah recognized it because he took a second wife to get the children. He, because he had a lack of faith in God's purpose and plan. But Hannah's still sitting there without. And you know what? He could be everything she needed in a husband, but he couldn't be one son to her, let alone ten. So Hannah, verse 9, rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat by a post of the temple of the Lord, and she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Now, let me say this on Elkanah's behalf. And again, we live in a different, uh, I, we believe in one man for one woman, for one life. We are not justifying what Elkanah did. He was a foolish man, made a foolish decision that, that he had to, to live with the rest of his life. But overall, he was a godly man and faithful to the things of God. And remember what time this is. This is a time of the judges when every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. And things are, the, it's getting darker and darker. Do you know Eli is sitting in the gate of the temple, an old man and a glutton, an old fat man that was a glutton. He's got two sons that are, it's well documented that they're immoral. It's an act of bravery just for Elkanah to take two wives, knowing what we know about Hophni and Phinehas, stealing the wives of the men that come to worship at the temple. The men would go to pray and they'd take their wives. So let's give Elkanah a little credit here. He was faithful year by year to come and to worship in the, the house of God and at a time when everybody had given up, he was still there. And he was faithful in worship and obedience to what he knew. Boy, that didn't take the tears from Hannah. And she cried, her, she was in bitterness of soul. There was an emptiness. That, there was something in, inside of her that could not be filled any other way. And so she made a covenant in verse number 11. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. I want you to look and where he said, If thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me and not forget thine handmaid. That comes back in in just a few moments here, later in this chapter. But she made a covenant with God. She cried out to the Lord, to Jehovah, the God which is, the God which was, and the God which shall always be. And she said, if, if you will look upon me in my affliction, if you will remember me, if you won't forgive me, if, if she said, if you will give unto the handmaid, and she was specific, not just a child, but a man child, she said, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. She referred to the vow of a Nazarite. Now, the vow of a Nazarite was honestly a vow that was meant, typically, that was not a lifetime vow. In fact, it was a vow that normally took place over a period of 40 days, six weeks. It was a, a, a guy that had a bad haircut. And once the vow was kept, they shaved their head, and, the, and they were released from the vow. That was the typical Nazarite vow. But there are only two Nazarites uh, there's, again, Nazareth is a city, and Nazarene is a citizen from a city. The, uh, uh, the sect of the Nazarenes from Nazareth, referring to Jesus of Nazareth. But a Nazarite was something altogether. It was, a, it was an individual that for a period of time had been wholly consecrated, set apart to God. And there's only two lifetime Nazarites in the Bible. 
And that was Samson and Samuel. Those two men are the only lifetime Nazarites that you have record of in the Bible. I'm sure there were men that took Nazarite vows. But as far as a lifetime Nazarite, she said, God, I'll make you a promise that from the day this child is born, that, that I will return him to you because he's a gift from you. I thought, Listen to me, moms and dad, that's not an easy vow to make. You've heard me say through the years, you've heard me tell the story many times, where the first time I went to say to Jesse, and I wanted to say something spiritual, we brought her home from the hospital, and I, I, all these people were praying over the baby bottles and all this stuff, and I wanted something that was just me, and, and I, I wanted to say to Jesse, I love you, Jesse, and Jesus loves you more. And I said, I love you, Jesse. And I'm telling you, I stopped right there. And in my mind, in my finite mind, and in my humanity, and honestly, my carnality, I said, there ain't no way that God loves this, this baby more than I do especially after what we've been through to get her here. But I knew, but then God smote my heart. I also, in that time, God reminded me, yes, I do love her more. It's not easy to give your children back to the Lord for a lifetime. But it's the right thing. And nobody that's made that vow has lived to regret it. That cry was a pretty serious cry. That covenant was a pretty serious covenant. Do you know what she did? She made a faith promise. See, that faith promise thing, church, that has permeated throughout every dispensation of Christianity in the history of the world. Everything, it is our faith and the promise of God. If we are faithful to what we have committed to the Lord, God has a promise to respond to our faith. Look at verse 12. This goes on. Now she's made this vow, but now she continues on with her complaint. And it came to pass as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, not only her lips but moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought, she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. What, a, what, a, what kind of condition was Israel in that he thought that a woman had come to pray in the, the tabernacle of Shiloh drunk? Does it, I mean, he told her to, to, not, to knock it off, but he didn't seem put off. It didn't seem surprised at all to find her in that condition. And Hannah answered, verse 15, and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not, count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. Now, I'm going to be honest, no one we know about Eli, I don't know if that meant very much coming from him because he wasn't doing real well and not doing right by the Lord at all. I don't know that God honored Eli, but he sure honored Hannah's complaint. Because look at verse 18. I want you to see her countenance. And she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. What, what does the name Hannah mean? Grace. Here she is down the road of life, and a woman whose life is supposed to be identified by grace and beauty is still looking for it. And she said, so the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. That was an act of faith. Look, I'm going to tell you something. That woman wasn't eaten. She was in sorrow of spirit. There was nothing, there was nothing her husband could do. There was nothing anyone could do. But when she gave her complaint to God, she could go her way on the way home, stop at the McDonald's drive through and get a Big Mac with extra pickle and a milkshake and was no more sad. She went home, that was no more sad. How do you get rid of sadness? A, a, a sadness that had been a sorrow for years. How do you wipe that away? Just, 
This guy said, go that way. And she went and she said, okay, we're good now. Women are hard to figure out. Have you all figured that out? <laughs> they can flip a switch like that. I don't even know. Sometimes I know God's omniscient. But there's sometimes I think he needs to prove it to us. She was satisfied. She could do nothing more. She had done all that she could. She was satisfied that whether or not God answered her prayer according to her will, that God would answer according to His will. And folks, there, just, there has to be a point in our lives with each and every one of us, regardless of, the, what, uh, of what our situation and circumstances might be, that we are just okay, that it's all right. I'm in the will of God now. God has a purpose. God has a plan. And I, I'm just, I can be okay with that. And you know what it says? That she rose in the temple in the morning. Verse 19, early. She got up early the next morning and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah. She returned home in Ramah. Went to the temple. No more tears, no more crying. Now she worshiped. Look back at verse 11. If thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaids and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thy handmaid a, a, a man child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. Look at the last statement of verse number 19. And Elkanah, Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and the Lord remembered her. Now you have a child. Aren't you glad that God does not forget us? That God does not forget our affliction? That He is sensitive to our sorrows and our cries? God, do not forget me. God, remember me. And the Lord remember her. By the way, you chase that, that phrase throughout the Bible. It says that the Lord remembered Noah. He had been a year on that ark while God was judging the sins of humanity just as he's about to do the second sign. But God does not forget. The Lord is, uh, the, 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 God, the Bible tells us that God is not unrighteous to forget or to reward our labors. In verse 20, wherefore it came to pass, it always comes to pass, when the time was come about after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. Do you know what Samuel means? Asked of God and answered. Dr. John o. Rice always used to say that prayer is not just asking. Prayer is asking and receiving. If you have asked and not received, you have not prayed because God never speaks of unanswered prayer. Now, God doesn't always answer. We understand. God, knows, God has always three answers to prayer. Yes, no, and wait. We don't like wait, and we definitely don't like no, but they are answers. And if we are conscious, if we really were in tune, God answers with yes far more than we give him credit for. A child. A son. But you know what grace is? Grace is getting what we did not deserve. And grace always comes with more than we deserve. Did you know if you looked at chapter 2 that God gave Hannah... And Hannah kept her promise. We know that in the end of this chapter. She brings him to the temple. She weaned that child. And you imagine about three, four years of age taking him. How many of you would take your, your child? And there was a distance from Shiloh to where they lived in Mount Ephraim. It was several days journey. It wasn't like she could just take the minivan and drive 15 minutes down the road to leave him in the temple. God gave her seven more children, sons and daughters. Gave her eight children, counting Samuel. And when he gave her Samuel, he did something that she did not ask for. That son, when there was no open vision, and the word of the Lord was precious. Do you know why it says that in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 3? Because that's when God began to speak and to shine his light. Ere the lamp of God went out, in the tabernacle, the light of the presence of God shined by a small boy, and God began to speak again. By the way, you don't know what God has for your children. You know, and parents, 
I'm, we, again, you can have a home or you can have a Christian home. And what I know is, and this, look, every parent has a struggle. You got plans for your kid, but you better not forget that God has plans too. And that his plans supersede our plans and our desires. Those are his heritage. Those are his, inher this, his inheritance, his reward. And that, that is a sacred trust. That's a great responsibility. And that's, that's his child. And if you can't trust God with your child and God with his plan, you're going to be that same person that's spinning the wheels in the book of Judges doing what's right in your own eyes. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be unkind of anybody, but I've been at this long enough, over 25 years and over 20 of them here, uh, the only 20 of them here, I've lived long enough to watch people reap what they've sown in their children. And I've seen people with their plan. Now, I understand that God has a plan for a child. And I've seen where parents did follow God's plan. And a child of their own free will broke their parents' heart. And that happened to God the Father in the Garden of Eden. But I'm going to tell you, if you follow your plan, they dead sure will never follow God's plan. There has to be the least that where we say that uh, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it. That, that, that Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And if you don't follow God's plan, if you don't follow God's plan and you're just following your own, they'll never turn out to be anything. I'm going to tell you something. Not every child, this doesn't mean every child is going to grow up and be a pastor or a missionary or, or, or marry a pastor or marry a missionary. But I'm going to tell you what, every child, of, uh, we're talking about God's children, ought to grow up to be a real Bible-believing Christian and a real witness for Jesus Christ. And a light. Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but, the, the, but the, they leave it that might give light to all that are in the house. Our children ought at least grow up to be lights. And I'll tell you what, if we put Jesus Christ as much emphasis on him in our homes as we did academics and athletics, we could once again turn the world upside down for Christ as a house adjacent to it. And I'm not against, look, I'm not against strengthening the body or the mind. In fact, I want a child that's greatest strength is something more than their thumbs, all right? I'm not against that. I think we ought to, I, there's, no, there's no honor in ignorance. I don't think, I believe that we ought to educate. But I, I'm just here to tell you, we're talking about Christian homes, and that ought to be the preeminent work and purpose of everything that we do. And we'll take time to teach our little girls how to paint their nails and teach a boy how to throw a ball and, and, and how to catch a fish. But I'm going to tell you what's really important is helping to memorize those verses. When they come home from Wednesday night and they're memorizing verses in children's church and say, what's your memory verse this week? We're going to go over those every single day this week. Right, that, that hiding thy word in thy heart that I might not sin against thee, that was again written by an adult man for, for God's people. And when the Bible was first put out and they began burning them as fast as they could publish them, the first thing that they realized was that the, the men, the fathers of the homes, had to memorize God's word if, it was going, if, there was, if they were going to continue to have its light. We need some moms and dads that will hide their, God's words in their hearts. Do you know what? It was easy for me to teach Jesse Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Because I learned Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. From my parents. Train up a child. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That was written for an adult son who would be the king and, quite frankly, squandered a throne because he could go his own way. But he wouldn't go God's. I'm going to tell you one of the most important things your children do. Your daddies look at me. I'm going to tell you one of the hardest, I don't know what it is, but the hardest thing for a man is to pray in front of his wife and children. But I'm going to tell you one of the most important things you'll ever do is pray out loud in front of your wife and children every single day. I'm not talking about blessing your breakfast. I'm talk, and I'm not saying that you've got to pray for an hour and a half, but getting your family together and letting them hear the voice of their father. You've heard me say this for years, uh, that the, the, the woman is the Holy Spirit of the home. And ma'am, you are either a thermometer or a thermostat. And a therm thermometer says which way is the wind blowing, and that's the temperature and, it, and its ungoverned emotions. And a thermostat says, I will set the tone, I will set the spirit, I will set the temperature of my home. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord and give us a dad that when 
a child looks in the face of their father, that is the impression that they get of God in heaven. And when they pray, Our Father who art in heaven, for good or for bad, what they think of God is what they think of dad. And what you think of God is what you project. Listen to me, mom and dad. What you think of God is what you project on your children's lives. See, this is an act of consecration. Look at verse 24. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her and with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. By the way, you've got to get them when they're young. You've got to get them when they're children, not adolescents. You ain't going to buy two. You ain't going to have them when they're 12. And brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here, praying unto the Lord. She stood by that pillar where she had leaned upon and prayed and stood in a place of answer prayer. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. I love that word consecration. It's a Bible word that means to, to be ground into powder to fill a mold, just like you would melt lead to make a sinker for a fishing pole or a bullet for your gun. It means to grind into dust and to, to put that in a mold. It means to fill the hand of God. That means God is in absolute control. God is the all-powerful, all-governing force in life. She gave him to fill the hand of God for his power and for his glory. Have you given your children to the Lord? Look at just across the page, chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. I'm almost done, you hope. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen and ephod. Moreover, Mama wasn't done yet. His mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Children outgrow things quickly, don't they, Mom and Dad? Can't keep them in shoes. Good night. You buy them shoes like Bozo the Crown. You know, do you have two fingers at the front? Do you have three? And they wear them out before they outgrow them half the time. You can't keep them in shoes. Can't keep them in clothes. They're, they're, uh, you got a boy, he's going to tear, tear the knees out. The girls too. They grow so quickly. Every year a new coat. If you know anything about a coat in the Bible, it's always associated with grace, the Father's righteousness, we saw it this morning with the church of Sardis. Joseph in his coat of many colors. It is a, that coat was not just the normal day-to-day -day clothes. She made sure that, and always associated with righteousness, her work was not done. She thought about that boy, even as she's given birth to seven more children and, and raising them at home. Samuel was always on her mind. You're going to tell me that woman didn't pray for that child every day of his life? By the way, parents, pray for your children every day of their life. That's part of that sacred trust and responsibility. She did not purchase a coat. It says that, that she made him a little coat. She wasn't going to pass that off. That wasn't the job of the Christian school teacher. Thank God for Christian school teachers. That wasn't the job of the Sunday school teacher. Thank the Lord for them. They, knew they have a place. But no, one's in, no one takes the place of a parent. Again, it's not enough. I'm going to tell you who loses their kids. It's the parents that bring their kids to church and they want the Sunday school teacher, the children's church worker, and the youth pastor, and the Christian school teacher that ultimately they'll blame one day and the pastor for the kids turning out like a bunch of hellions because they didn't want to take care of business at home. No, that child was on her mind every single day. And every day, every year, she's thinking, Samuel's going to be another year older. He's going to be another year taller. I'm going to have to get the wool. I'm going to have to win. I'm going to have to weave that. Uh, and, and boy, I'm sure as she made that coat a labor of love day by day, watching that child become what they ought to become. By the way, mom and dad, the child will never be what they ought to be unless mom and dad are what they ought to be. It 
So how did it all work out? This is what I love. Do you see verse 19 in chapter 1? And they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house to Ramah. They went home to Ramah. Chapter 7, verse 17. Verse 15, Samuel judged Israel all the days, all the days of his life. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. By the way, it wasn't a perfect world that Samuel grew up in. There was problems in the church that he attended. There's problems in every church you've ever attended. But Samuel made a decision. By the way, you can't outweigh the influence of a mother and a father. And he went from year to year in circuit to Bethel, the house of God, to Gilgal, Mizpah, the witness, and judged Israel and all those places. And his return was to Ramah. For there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. You know what? When, when, God, when, when she brought that child to God's house and left him there, do you know God knew what was in that woman's heart? And God let that boy grow up and come home. But when he came home, he came home the light and the prophet of Israel. Hamuel prayed before an altar in the house of God, and Samuel built an altar in his house. And I wonder if Mama was still living, if Hannah and Samuel prayed at that altar together. That's full circle. By the way, moms and dads, one of the best things you can do is Get on your knees with your children at home and have a family altar. And I don't care if you read one of the Psalms at six verses. Just read a chapter a day. You don't have to have an hour. By the way, one of the best things you can do is there got to be times when you grew up and, and as you're raising your children in the house of God that you come to an altar that God has given you here in his house at this place and you come and mom and dad and the children and the younger the better and you just they just hear you, mom and dad, crying out with the voice of God, praying for wisdom, praying for their, your children to come to know Christ as their Savior and that they would grow to be all that God wants them to be and not just all that you desire them to be. It's always good to come home to an altar, especially when the light's at home. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the man that would become the great prophet, the priest, and the king of Israel, anointed by God to lead his people. And Father, we need more children to grow up to be like Christ. We need more Christians to be more leaders, as Samuel was. We need more that can handle the word of God as he did. We need more that can serve in the priesthood of believers as he served as a priest. Father, we need more Elkanahs and Hannahs that are committed every single day of their life to get up and make it the purpose of their day to raise new lights for Jesus Christ. Bless those that come to an old-fashioned altar tonight in Jesus' name. Let's stand. The piano's playing. The altar's open. The Holy Spirit of God has spoken to you somewhere along the way.